everybody, I am That Nursing Prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the four P's of labor. So let's get into it. The first P is the passageway, aka the birth canal. This consists of the pelvis, so the bones, and in the soft tissues of the cervix and the vagina. There's four types of pelvises that your patient might have. The first of which is the gynecoid. So the majority of women will have a gynecoid pelvis. Not everybody though, but it is the most common and that's a good thing because it's the most favorable for vaginal delivery. And a way you can remember this is what's an OBGYN, a gynecologist, right? It's a doctor that takes care of women's reproductive health. So you can remember gynecoid pelvis. An anthropoid pelvis, some women have it, not very common, can give birth vaginally though. An android pelvis, usually this is associated with men. Men have an android pelvis. And then a platypoid pelvis. If you think of a platypus, a duck-billed platypus, that little animal, right? They're, it's really flat, right? Their bill is really flat. So a platypoid pelvis is a really like flat-shaped pelvis. You cannot give birth vaginally if you have a platypoid pelvis you would have to have a C-section. But this one is super rare. I think it's like less than 3% of all women have a platypoid pelvis. So these are the four different types of pelvises your patient might have. And then a special note about this is, it's an old wives tale, so I wanna bring it up. You cannot determine the size and shape of a woman's pelvis just by looking at her. That's kind of an old fashioned thing where they go, oh, look at you, you've got good childbearing hips. Or the opposite, they'll be like, oh no, you're too little, you can't give birth vaginally. You're, if you have a baby over six pounds, you're gonna need a C-section, you're too tiny. No, that's just absolute baloney, okay? I've seen people with bigger hips have, you know, littler babies and need C-sections. I've seen, you know, women who are four foot nine and weigh nothing have, you know, 10 pound babies. So. This is an old wives tale. You cannot tell somebody's pelvis or how they're gonna do in labor just by looking at them. Now let's move on to the second P. The second P is the passenger. So everything that's coming out of mom. Of course the baby, we know that one, but also the amniotic fluid, the placenta, and the membranes. If we are doing a vaginal exam on baby, it's really important if baby's head down that we can use the skull, baby's head, to figure out what way baby is looking, what their position is. And the way we do this is by feeling for their sutures. So if you haven't watched my newborn video when I talk about the sutures, I'll do a little quick thing here. So you have your sutures, you have your corneal, which is like a headband, and your sagittal, which is like a mohawk, and we can feel for those on baby's head. And that helps us determine which way baby is facing. Another important component of baby's head is molding. So you may have seen pictures of a newborn baby and they kind of have like a little cone head thing going on where it's like elongated. That's okay, that's a good thing. That's what baby's head has to do to help it make its way down through the birth canal. If our skulls didn't do that, then no one would ever be able to give birth vaginally because they'd be fused shut. So that's a good thing. Lots of new vocab words when it comes to the passenger. So the attitude has to do with baby's posture. So we like normal flexed resting posture, which is like chin to chest, like this, okay? So this could be baby's attitude. This could be baby's attitude where it's extended, right? So it's much more difficult to give birth vaginally like this than it is like this. Can you do it? Yeah, you can do it. But is it harder? Yeah. So it's good to know baby's attitude. So the relationship of the presenting part, so maybe baby's head, to the other body parts. Babies lie. Now I know, terrible drawing, but I tried to show you. It's baby's long axis, which is baby's back, in relation to mom's back. So ideally, baby would be head down and then their back would be in line with mom's back. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes baby is horizontal or what we call transverse. They have a transverse lie where it is not parallel with mom's back. Their presentation. 
There's three types of presentation. Cephalic, which is the most common, the most ideal, that's head down. We like babies to be born head down. Shoulder, which is just their shoulder. And breech. Now I'm sure you've probably heard of breech before, which is when baby's bottom is the presenting part instead of their head, so they're upside down kind of. Um, it's not as common as cephalic, but it is definitely more common than shoulder. There are three different types of breech position. There's complete breech, which is where baby's kind of like sitting like this and their legs are crossed. Frank breech, which is where they're kind of, they look like they're diving into a pool, like their toes to their nose kind of thing, like straight up. And then there's footling breech, which is one of their legs comes out, so you might see their foot first. Their station refers to the level of the ischial spines. So baby's presenting part, whatever it be, their head, their shoulder, their booty, whatever, in relation to the ischial spines of mom's pelvis. At zero, that means they are right there. They are right at the level of the ischial spines. If they're in the negative, it means they're still kind of high. They're floating up there. And once they start going into the positive, it means they're engaged and they're ready to start pushing. In a perfect world, we would let all women labor down and get to plus two station before they started pushing. That would be great. That would be so much easier on mom and you as the nurse. Um, of course, we don't have any control over that, but that would be ideal. We don't want to push at the negative numbers, zero. There's no point in that, okay? She's just going to get exhausted. It's not going to help her make progress. And then finally, positioning. How do we determine baby's positioning? Well, it's three steps. The first step, using our sutures, doing our badge exam, we're going to see, is baby facing left or right? Then we're going to figure out, okay, well, what's the presenting part? Is it baby's head? If it is, then it's the occiput. Is it their bottom? Then it is sacrum. Their face is called mentum. So sometimes it's their face that's coming up first. Or is it their shoulder? And then the third step is determining, is this baby anterior, posterior, or transverse? And I put little examples here. So ideally, we like babies to be LOA, which is left occiput anterior, okay? So baby is facing down. So baby is facing the opposite direction of mom. That means their head is flexed and it's gonna be a little bit easier to give birth to them that way. Oftentimes, babies can present as LOP, which is left occiput posterior. And sometimes we call that like sunny side up. So basically, if you picture the baby in mom's stomach, baby is looking up at the ceiling. And it is a lot harder for baby to do those cardinal movements and to flex their chin because they can't, because they have the pelvis behind their head. So we call that back labor. And sometimes back labor is longer and more painful and results in a C-section. Not all the time, I had back labor. I still gave birth vaginally. It can happen, people do it all the time. But it's not fun. <laughs> it's not the most ideal kind of labor. LOA is the most ideal kind of labor. So this is the second P, this is the passenger. The third P is for powers. The powers are the contractions. And the contractions are incredibly important in labor because they cause the os to open, to dilate, so to go from zero to 10 centimeters, and the cervix to get thinner and shorter. This is called effacement. So the parts of the contraction are actually very important as well. So let's go through those. So as the contraction is getting stronger, increasing in intensity, it's called the increment. So you can remember increment, increase. Its strongest point is the peak or the acme. As it's going down, decreasing, that's called the decrement. And then the point in between contractions is called the interval. So why do you need to know all that information? Because think about it, what point would be the best time to encourage mom to push? The peak, right? So her body is involuntarily doing this. So we're going to encourage voluntary pushing and bearing down at this point because this is going to help mom push baby out a little bit faster and a little bit easier. We should definitely not be pushing 
during the interval. The interval is the time in which baby is getting reoxygenated. Some other words related to the contractions are frequency, intensity, and duration. Frequency is the one I'm sure you already know, where they say, I'm having contractions every two to three minutes. That's how frequent you're having them. So from the start of one contraction to the start of another contraction, how often are you having them? That's the frequency. The intensity is how strong are they? So are they really, really strong contractions? Are they really great? Are they really like weak, piddly little ones that aren't doing much? They're not causing much cervical change. So how strong, how intense are the contractions? And in the duration, how long does one contraction last? So the duration is from the start of one contraction to the end of that very same contraction. So how long did it last? 30 seconds, that's not great. 60 seconds, that's great, right? So all this stuff matters and it's all gonna help mom and it's gonna help you as the nurse coach mom in the second stage of labor, which is the pushing stage. Our fourth and final P is the psyche. And this is the one that people tend to forget about. You know, the other ones, they make sense. You have your birth canal, you have the baby, you have the contractions, it all makes sense, right? But the psyche is actually really important too. This is mom's like mental state during labor and delivery. And it can affect things in a negative way if we don't have a good understanding of it. So what are some things that can affect the woman's psyche? Her culture. So some cultures, when they're in labor, they're having those sort of pains. We express it freely and we scream and yell and hoot and holler and all that stuff. Where other cultures, they're taught to be more reserved and stoic during labor. Preparation for labor. So has she read any books, seen any videos? Has she taken a birthing class? Or has she had no preparation whatsoever, right? Those people are gonna go into this situation very differently, right? Support system. So does she have a support system there? Is the father of the baby involved? Is he present? Is grandma there? Does she have a lot of people with her? Or is she all by herself? Previous births. So this can include, you know, having other children in the past or attending the birth of somebody else. So maybe like her older sister had a baby and she was there and there were complications and now she's terrified because what happened to her sister's baby is going to happen to her baby, that kind of thing. Or it could be a positive thing where she's had babies in the past and they were uncomplicated, easy, breezy, no problems. She's probably going to go into this thinking this is going to be exactly the same, easy, no problems. Her current pregnancy, so has she had an uncomplicated, no issues pregnancy? If she's had that, she's probably gonna assume she's gonna have an uncomplicated, no issues delivery. Or has she had issues? Has she been preeclamptic? Has she been put on bed rest? That kind of stuff. That's gonna affect the way she goes into the delivery and the way she kind of feels about the delivery. And then finally, I kind of put them all together, pain, is she distracted by pain? Is she afraid of what's gonna to happen to her or the baby? And then anxiety. All of these things, believe it or not, can actually stop your labor. So even if you're coming in and you're in good labor, you're you know four centimeters and you're in active labor and you're ready to have this baby, but you're in so much pain or you're so worried and afraid about what's gonna happen, it can actually cause your contractions to stop and take you out of labor. And we don't want that. We don't want to put people out of labor who are term and ready to be in labor, right? So it's your job as the nurse to assess mom's emotional, mental status during labor and if there's any issues to help fix those issues as best we can. So if she's all alone, you're gonna be her support system. You're gonna do that anyway because you're her advocate as the nurse. Um, if she has a culture where they express pain freely, let her scream and yell. You're not going to go in there and shush her and say, stop doing that, right? Let her do it. Or if she just wants you to hold her hand so she can squeeze your hand, let her do that, okay? So assessing mom's psyche is also really important, and we shouldn't forget about this, our fourth P. So this is my video on the four P's of labor. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. If not, I'll see you on the next one.